All right, Becky, you're good to go. All right. Okay, everyone, welcome to the IU College Free Departure Seminar. This is our first ever webinar, so thank you for joining us. Uh, today we're just going to talk you through some of the um, pre-departure logistics, kind of get you oriented and fill you in on what to expect during your time in X and also just some useful tools to know before you go. So to start off with, um, I'm sure you've all received uh, notifications now from uh, Kate Freyhoff, uh, all of, or Freyhoff, sorry Kate, okay. all about the post acceptance documents and things that you still need to submit. So we just be sure to do that. I believe that the enrollment or that the deadline to submit these is December 7th. Is that correct, Kate? Yep, it's coming up. And some of you won't have to uh, submit all of these requirements because we have agreements with your school. Um, so our SUNY students, your deposit actually goes right to your, to your institution. So um, if you just follow the emails that you're sent, the personal emails, then you'll be good to go. So this lists some of the things that um, you probably were required to submit, the physician statement, um, your digital photos, so that all of our staff and administrators and faculty and IAU can identify you when you arrive, and your travel itinerary so that we know when to expect you um, in X. And again, there I sent out a link uh, to all of you. If, for those of you that are interested, you can um, submit your travel itinerary on a Google Doc. That way, other students that are traveling um, who might be on your flight can contact you, and you guys can plan to meet up either during one of your layovers or when if you arrive in Paris together, if you arrive in X. So just a little travel buddy. Um, again, it's optional, but uh, I highly recommend and encourage you to do it. It's also another way for us to track literally and figuratively where you're going and how you're getting there. So if your flight's delayed, we have your information. Mm -hmm. And again, if you have any questions about any of the post acceptance documents, you can always email Kate. She yep. is wonderful and great at answering any and all questions. She's probably heard them all a million times. So. Um, one thing that I wanted to talk about right before we get into um, the actual um, semester itself is a really cool program that we started. It's the Early Start Program. It's an optional week-long program that will begin about a week before your spring semester. So this is a way for you to move in early with your host family, kind of get oriented in X. You get an individualized orientation, so you can meet the professors, meet the faculty, familiarize yourself with the city, get a little tour, um, practice your French as well. Um, I know after Christmas break, you might be a little rusty not having practiced it during the past couple of weeks, so this is a great kind of way to ease yourself into it before the, the big rush of spring semester begins. Um, if you're interested, all you need to do is just uh, email Kate and let her know and we can talk you through the next steps uh, for the program start date. So that program start is on January 19th. Um, so it's a couple of days before the um, January 26th start date. Another option that we have as, a, as an early start is the J-Term Travel Seminar. This will be our second year uh, running the Travel Seminar, and it's a really unique opportunity to visit 12 different cities in France, Spain, and Morocco. It starts on um, January 6th, and it runs from the 6th through the 24th. So that's a little under three weeks of visiting these different places. You can actually earn credits in either French, Spanish, political science, cross-cultural studies, art history and history, and it's a fabulous way to see Europe and kind of uh, whet your appetite for your semester abroad while also earning credits. Um, the program itself includes all of your transportation within Europe and Morocco, so it'll include your flight from France to Morocco, your bus, uh, your private bus that you'll take in Morocco, the hydrofoil that you'll take across the Strait of Gibraltar into southern Spain. It includes, obviously, your tuition costs, all of your hotel stays, all of your breakfast, most of your dinner. So it's a really um, unique thing to IAU College. And if you're interested, I, um, there's still a couple of spots available. So we can, um, we can still accommodate those of you that would like to join us. Yes. And let me just show you really quickly um, if I have it up, our J-Term Travel Seminar Itinerary. 
This is also a really great opportunity if you're planning on doing a lot of traveling while you're abroad. Um, it's kind of nice this way you can really experience um, France, Spain, and Morocco before your semester starts. And then that'll give you more time on weekends to explore France while you're there. Um, I know we had a couple of students who did it last year who really enjoyed that aspect of it. So that way, um, on the weekends, they could actually you know, explore the south of France and, and things like that. Here, let me see. Can you guys see this JTERM map? Or probably not. Let me let me add that in. Hi. So this is kind of a little overview of the tour and where you go. So you can see you start in Paris, go to Aix, fly from Marseille into Marrakesh, visit those cities in Morocco before going across the Strait of Gibraltar into southern Spain. So again, this information is available. Um, I can send it out to you. You can also access it online. Um, and now continuing on, so what to expect after, after, or what to know before you go? What to pack, what to bring, when to arrive? So as I mentioned, the arrival date will be January 26th, um, the 19th for those of you that are choosing to do the Early Start program. Um, there's a lot of detailed information about the arrival on our website, um, and so I highly encourage you to visit that. But just kind of the basics that you should know is you need to arrive at the Marseille airport, that's the MRS airport, the MRSS, um, or the Aix-en-Provence uh, TGV, or the, the fast train uh, station between 8 a.m. and 7 p.m. And there'll be an IE representative there to meet you and then take you to your host family. Mm -hmm. If um, if for some reason your flight's delayed or if you're unable to get to Aix-en-Provence during that time frame and you need to arrive later, you will need to arrange a stay at a hotel. And there's a number of hotels on our website that we recommend. So for those of you in that situation, um, that is that information is also available to you. And then as I mentioned before, um, be sure to enter your flight information or at least submit it to us before you leave so that we have that on record. You can also submit it into that Google Doc. Mm -hmm. And now, one of the questions that we get a lot is what to pack, what to wear. Kate and I are both IAU alums. Um, I studied abroad there in the fall of 2005, and Kate was there in fall of 2009. So we can tell you from experience um, that the important thing is not to overpack when you go, because you will end up purchasing a lot of items while you are abroad, and you want to leave room for those. So remember, pack only the necessities. Um, you also are going to want to check your airline weight limits. This varies um, airline to airline. Generally, for overseas travels, you get at least one free suitcase. But again, this is going to vary according to the airline. Um, you're also going to want to check and make sure that your uh, luggage doesn't exceed the weight limit, uh, just because that will be extra fees, extra cost. So sometimes it's cheaper to pack two suitcases and have them both weigh 50 pounds as opposed to one 100 pound suitcase. Plus it'll make it easier to travel and transport. Um, packing tips from past students. So this is a list of some items that we recommend. Uh, in the pre-departure booklet that I sent a couple of weeks ago, the X booklet, it has a more detailed packing list that itemizes uh, things that students in the past have recommended. Um, and that have suggested future students bring with them. Um, one thing that always takes up a lot of space are shoes. So remember, you're going to X. It's a great place. It's a great city. It has lots of shopping. So you can always purchase things that you forget. Um, and it's always fun to bring back a pair of European shoes as kind of a souvenir. And sneakers, all that is available there as well. So keep that in mind when packing. You don't need to overdo it. And the other big thing that you'll want to be sure to purchase before you leave is an adapter or a converter. So the adapter is necessary because the voltage in Europe is different from that in the United States. Um, it's 110 versus 220. So you can purchase um, adapters in Target, at Fry's Electronics, at a lot of, um, at most electronic stores, they should have them. And then the converter is what you use to change the prongs. So here in the United States, we have the two skinny prongs. In Europe, they're actually round prongs. So you can buy the converters, um, again, and the, um, at Target. Usually, they're right next to the adapters. And, and um, Go ahead. Oh, sorry, Becca. Um, your laptops, you know how your charger typically has that big box 
um, that's like connected to like the cord. Um, that's actually a converter for most people. And so if you just check this little box, all you'll need for your laptop is actually um, the uh, you know the adapter to get it to plug into the wall. Um, but that box that's part of your charger acts as the converter between the two um, strengths. And so that's just something that you can note because that way you can use um, the adapters and converters that you buy for other electronics. Great. Thanks, Kate. Yeah. One thing you're going to want to remember uh, when packing is just to keep with you really important documents. Anything that you really couldn't be without for a week or two in the case that your baggage does get lost. So prescription medicines, be sure that you keep what you need with you. Um, also, before you leave, you're going to want to pack your, or you're going to want to get as um, about three months worth of your prescription medicine and as well as bringing your prescription with you, the RX, so that if you run out or if it gets lost or gets ruined, you're able to um, pick it up from the French pharmacies. Um, also, as I mentioned here, your important documents, change of clothes, those are all recommended to bring with you in your carry-on. Um, like I said, packing prescriptions, um, bring copies of it, um, talk to your physician before you leave so that you can go over any specific details that you might need to know. Being in Europe, in addition to you know, being outside of the United States. Also, there's a lot of um, stress, or you can be, you know, in a different situation that could affect how your medication is taken. So just be sure to discuss all this with your physician, and since you'll have to get your physician statement, or most of you will, anyways, it's a good time to just bring up that, that topic with them. Kate, anything to chime in here? Um, I think that pretty much covers it. We do have physicians in X who we've worked with for a number of years. They're familiar with IU College and with our students. Um, so if you uh, need to get a prescription filled while you're over there, they can help with that through a physician's visit. Um, and if there's ever anything that you need in terms of visiting a doctor, anything along those lines, you're always welcome just to visit our staff. Um, all of our staff in France have an open door policy, and if you ever uh, want to speak with a physician or set up a meeting, they can help facilitate that for you. Perfect. Thanks, Kate. Sure. And then also before you leave, you're going to want to make sure you make copies of all these important documents. Uh, you're all going through the visa process now, and that visa is so valuable. So be sure to make a copy of um, that page on your passport as well as your basic information on your passport copy of your insurance card and your credit card numbers in case it gets lost or stolen, you'll be able to call it in and, and have it canceled. Um, you're gonna, I would recommend leaving a copy at home with, your, with a family member or with a friend and then bring a copy of all of them with you so that you have um, enough resources should something happen to the originals. Um, when you're in X, you're going to be going through a, a really lengthy on-site orientation, and they'll also discuss a lot of these matters with you, but something just to keep in mind is when you travel locally in France, uh, you don't need to bring your passport. I would keep it at home in a safe place so that you don't lose it. Um, usually, most places will accept a U.S. driver's license to get in, um, and that'll be an acceptable form of ID, so that's really all you need when you travel locally within X. Um, Money-wise, a lot of students want to know what the best way to take out money is while you're abroad or what the best way to pay for things is. I highly recommend um, getting a credit card if you don't already have one, especially a MasterCard or a Visa. These two are the ones that are most widely accepted in Europe. American Express um, tends to be a little bit more difficult, especially in smaller cities or in smaller areas. So I would recommend talking to your bank, getting a credit card. That's going to give you the best exchange rate. And it's also the safest way to travel since you won't be carrying around a lot of cash on you. Um, another thing to keep in mind are um, getting an ATM card to withdraw money. When you withdraw money, it will come out in euros. So keep that in mind when you're selecting the amount you want to withdraw. And most banks also charge ATM withdrawal fees for using a separate bank. If you have um, Bank of America, they have partnered with a French bank called BNP. So that would be something to keep in mind when you withdraw from a BNP in your Bank of America. You aren't charged any sort of um, uh, withdrawal charge. And then when traveling, before you leave, I would recommend exchanging maybe $100 worth of, into euros so that you have some euros when you arrive in Europe and 
if you need to purchase anything, if you want to get a snack or need any sort of emergency money, you have that on hand. And you can do that, I believe, um, in the airport, but the airport usually has um, high high currency rates, so you don't always get the best deal. I believe that most banks will also let you exchange money. Kate, do you have any other suggestions? Yeah. If you're, um, if you or your parents are AAA members, you can also ex um, exchange U.S. dollars for euro at a AAA. Great. Um, and then finances. Just I know if you're playing the budget game, trying to figure out how much do you really need, what am I going to be buying. So something to consider. These are things that you can almost definitely count on purchasing while you're abroad, and that's going to be your daily lunch and your one dinner per week, as well as snacks that you. Um, might want on the weekends or while you're traveling or even during the day. Um, personal travel expenses too, and again this is going to vary student to student, but most likely you will be doing some sort of um, you know, individual travel, be it around France or if you decide to explore more of Europe. So those costs include flight, food, hotels, restaurants, entrance fees to museums, entrance fees into any other sort of um, event that you might want to attend. When I was there I went to a Coldplay concert in Marseille so there's just so many great venues and uh, fairs and events that go on in, in France. I highly encourage you to attend as many, but just be sure to budget accordingly. And then another thing that obviously you're going to want to bring home souvenirs and gifts so you can remember your time in Paris or your time in Aix and your trip abroad and also bring back gifts for your family and friends. Um, again, that's why it's so important to make sure your suitcase is not completely packed tight when you first get there so that you have room to bring stuff back in. Um, and then local travel, if you need to take taxis, buses, trains, that's something else that you might want to take into account when budgeting. So below are some estimates. Again, this is all very, very dependent upon the individual. The airfare, depending on where you're flying from, um, can really vary. And that's the round trip airfare from the United States to France and back. Um, additional meals. Again, depends on where you're eating, if you're getting just... The, there are a lot of cafes around um, the IU buildings that you can get a very good meal for not that much, but if you're going to nice restaurants at dinner, if you're traveling and eating out more, that could obviously um, increase the, the amount that you're paying. And then personal expenses uh, down there at the bottom, again, are going to vary according to the things I mentioned before. Kate, anything else you want to mention about finances? Um, I think the best thing to remember is just that you're going to be over there for four months, so uh, maybe don't buy all of your souvenirs within the first week or two. Give yourself some time. There are lots of shops over there, um, a lot of markets that are open during the week and on weekends, and those can be great places to buy gifts and souvenirs. Um, so I would just caution you to make sure you budget for the full four months. Um, the last thing we would want you to do is to get over there and then three months and realize that you know, maybe you don't have enough for that last month. Um, so just keep in mind that you're going to be over there for a little while. The same thing you do at school. I'm sure you guys are all experienced with budgeting and um, making sure you can get through the semester with what you have. Um, so I would just, just be conscientious about it. Um, and definitely like take a little time and see what's available before you um, maybe buy souvenirs for people or gifts. Um, I know when I was over there I brought um, a bunch of gifts home for my family and I bought them probably within the last month. Um, once I knew, like, okay, this market has good prices, or I really like this vendor, um, that's a really fun part of the experience. So I hope you guys are looking forward to it. Thanks, Kate. Sure. And and then in bringing back gifts for your family, I'm sure you will have by that point communicated with them uh, throughout your time abroad, and you're going to want to share with them how you're doing, what you're doing about your host family, about your classes, your excursions. So one of the important things to think about before you go is. Um, how you're going to keep in touch with friends and family. Obviously, things have changed a lot since the seven years ago when I went abroad. The email and the internet are incredible, easy ways to keep in contact, and they're very affordable. Most, Some of them are even uh, free, just like this Google Hangout. Um, all of the buildings um, that IAU has in X are all Wi-Fi enabled, so you can... Um, you can use um, the internet from any point in our buildings and communicate with Skype. You can communicate with Google Chat. Um, I think there are a number of other, um, yeah, Yahoo Messenger. There are a number of other apparatuses that you could use um, when keeping in contact. So what I would recommend is maybe setting a time with friends and family back home um, that you'll plan to schedule your, your Skyping or your, your chatting 
so that you can all be online at the same time. Um, in terms of mailing, a lot of families want to send care packages. Just be cautioned that it can be expensive and also customs can be kind of difficult to, to deal with. So students can receive packages. The address is there below. Um, just make sure that you notify that your family notifies you when you're expecting a package. So if there is a holdup, um, you'll be more aware of it. Um, and then sometimes, depending on how much is being shipped, there could be insurance issues as well. Kate, do you have anything else to add about mailing? Uh, yeah. Um, well, pretty much everything that you addressed is what I would have brought up as well. Uh, just make sure you provide your family with your address before you leave. Um, a lot of times I'll get calls from parents who want to send something to, to you guys maybe as a surprise and they don't have these details. So I would suggest just leaving it with your family when you leave or um, any like, emergency contacts that you'd like to have it. Um, but other than that, it's, you know, it's a lot of fun to get mail while you're abroad. I know I have some friends who send me letters throughout uh, the semester and those are always a lot of fun to receive. So uh, don't uh, downplay snail mail because it can be a lot of fun while you're over there. And then, of course, cell phones are something that you're also going to want to think about before you leave. Um, when I studied abroad, I ended up purchasing a mobile phone. Um, when I arrived in X, you can pick up a phone for anywhere between 20 to 100 euros, just depending on, on you know how elaborate you want it to be. I just got a really... Um, inexpensive flip phone and it worked perfectly. You can pay as you go so what you do is you just purchase a certain amount of money and you put that amount onto your phone and you can use it and then when that expires or when you use that up you can just recharge it so that way you don't have to worry about um, having it connected and tied to a credit card and in those cases um, from my past experience students have ended up spending way more than they anticipated just because they're not notified about the charges until they get their um, credit card bill. So by paying as you go, you're able to regulate a little bit more and keep track of what you're spending. Um, another option um, is to bring your own personal um, smartphone. If you do choose to bring a smartphone, you're going to want to make sure that it is um, unlocked. Uh, I know that iPhones, this has been an issue in the past. Um, and then you also will want to speak to your um, mobile cell phone provider to see if there are any special rates that you can get, uh, what your phone number would be, um, how to dial out from France, how they can reach you in France. Um, just be careful because there are always a lot of like sneaky costs that can be accrued, especially if you're getting a data plan. Um, sometimes those can go over if you're downloading things on your phone. Um, if you do bring your iPhone, though, you can always use the Wi-Fi. Um, at the buildings or in other places around um, X that have that are Wi-Fi enabled. So that's also an option. Just be careful with iPhones because they are a big target for pickpocketers and for um, and they're a hot commodity here. They're very expensive in Europe, so you don't want to be too flashy with them when you're walking around in the evenings. Um, just be um, aware of that. Okay, anything else about cell phones? Uh, you know, I did the same thing that Rebecca did. I bought a burner phone when I was over there. Um, I never needed to re-up my minutes, and I think I only re-upped my texting one time. Um, and it was it was a pretty inexpensive way to have a cell phone while abroad. Um, so that's definitely something to consider. Um, our staff during orientation typically will have providers from local phone companies come in and talk with you guys. So um, if you don't get a you know a cell phone before you depart, that's absolutely okay. I'd say the majority of our students get them once they're in France. Um, and just know that our staff will help you with that during orientation. I know it can sometimes be hard if you're used to having a cell phone with you all the time in the States and then you go abroad and that's not necessarily the case when you first get there. Um, don't worry, they'll definitely help you with that. Yeah. Um, Carly, do you have any um, suggestions for cell phones uh, based on your time? Sure. Um, I had Orange, I think. I. Um... I, let's see, I bought the phone like the second week I was there and then pay as you go. Um, it's relatively expensive compared to what you would usually pay for for a cell phone here. Um, they don't have as many like deals as they do in the States for um, cell phone use. So I had just a basic like texting and minutes plan. Mm -hmm. And um, I would say it was probably pretty crucial just because I, um, I like everyone's in home stays so and no one lives together so if you're trying to meet up with someone like leaving your house 
and like heading to meet someone at like some restaurant, you want to be able to talk to them. So I definitely recommend having one, um, to say the least. Um, so then can you just buy a SIM card or is buying a phone in China? What'd you say? Um, is buying a phone necessary? You can buy a SIM card there. So if you have a smartphone, for example, um, and it's unlocked, then you can simply purchase a SIM card when you arrive in X, and that will give you your uh, a different phone number. It'll give you your French phone number, and it'll therefore become a French cell phone. Um, yeah. You're just gonna want to be. You're just gonna want to make sure that the um, phone is unlocked and that it does have that capability. I would. Go and talk to whoever your provider is, or if you have a BlackBerry, go to um, a store that sells them and just double check to see that that would be a possibility because it does vary depending on the different model of phone. But I know students in the past that have just bought the SIM card once they've arrived. So phone is not um not necessarily will work in like this one might not be um. Compatible with the the SIM cards there, right? Exactly. So some some phones are created so that they can't be used internationally. Uh, again, the best person to ask these questions to would be the um, maker of the phone itself. Usually, it's AT and T that works internationally, and Verizon doesn't. Um, but all iPhones in the U.S. now have SIM cards, so you definitely should check. Okay. Thank you. Great. All right. So let's just go a little bit into the arrival date, um, since that's going to probably be the most imminent for you. Um, traveling smart, I'm sure most of you have probably traveled, but for some of you, this might be your first time traveling alone. Um, just, just be smart. Don't offer to carry anything or hold anything that someone asks you to in the airport if you don't know them. Make sure you have all your important documents with you. Be sure to have all of your emergency phone numbers on you, too. So if you need to contact um, people at X, if you need to contact our U.S. office, you have that information when traveling. One important thing that I would highly recommend is to print out that booklet that was sent to you a couple of weeks ago that lists all of the important things to know, things to pack, important numbers, addresses, and have that in your carry-on. Mm -hmm. um, and then just watch your values as you're traveling. And then when you f do arrive in X, uh, be it by plane or by train, uh, there will be uh, IAU staff there to greet you and to take you to your host family. So you'll be able to look for them. Uh, again, they'll, be, they'll know when to expect you because you will have submitted your flight and train itinerary. Um, again, all this information is also posted on our website on, under Arrival Day. So. Um, if you have any questions, you can always access that information there. And then that being said, if your flight or train is delayed, don't panic. We've been doing this. This program's been running for, since 1958, so we've seen everything. You'll be okay. Um, again, just make sure you have the main number, um, and, make, and you can always email uh, us if you have any issues as well. So we'll be checking our email and our phones constantly. And then all the important numbers are right here. So these are the numbers that you're going to want to keep with you when you're traveling. Uh, Dr. Lee Smith will be your main contact on the day of travel. So he'll have the emergency phone that your parents can reach him at, that you can reach him at when you arrive in Europe, when you arrive in France. And obviously, you can always email us if you have any issues. Mm -hmm. Kate, anything else to add to the arrival? Um, just that the biggest thing to do if there's any issues with your travel, if for some reason a flight is delayed or you miss the flight, um, just reach out to IAU so that we know. Um, we will be tracking your flights throughout the day, but um, it's just best for us if you can either call or email. Um, we'll have staff members at the airport and at the train stations, um, as well as um, checking email. And so we'll, we'll have staff members at IAU College in our actual building. Uh, manning the phones and checking emails. So if for some reason you miss a flight, um, if you don't have access to a phone, if you have access to email, just 
send an email to either myself or any of our staff members, um, and we'll make sure it gets to the right people so that they're aware. Um, the best thing to do would be to call the emergency phone number first, if possible. And if that's not possible, then to move on to email. Um, just the biggest thing to remember, like Rebecca mentioned, is just don't panic. Um, don't worry, we've done this lots of times, so we're here to help you through the whole day. Um, our U.S. office is um, officially closed on arrival day weekends, but I'll still be checking phones and emails, um, but we'd like to encourage you just to contact our staff in France first because that's where you're headed, that's where they'll be picking you up, um, and we're, we're there to help you. So if anything does happen, just give us a call. Great. And now this is kind of some of the fun stuff. What to expect when you're an ex? And Carly, I see that you've joined us, so free feel, feel free to chime in if there's anything you want to add about your experience in ex. Sure. Great. So, um, a, uh, a recent IEU alum for everyone else out there. Great. Mm -hmm. So here's your spring schedule, um, so you can get an idea of when you're going to be having breaks. I think someone was asking on our Facebook page a couple days ago if there were going to be any breaks, and you guys actually are lucky. You get two breaks. You have a winter break and a spring break, so that's a great time to plan travels. Um, if you want to get outside of X, if you want to go maybe up to Paris, or if you want to um, visit a different country, it's a great time to look into that. I wouldn't recommend booking trips for both of those breaks at this point, just because you never know who you'll meet in between now and then, and sometimes things come up when you arrive, and you meet someone that has a friend that's studying abroad in Madrid, and they're going to go, and you might want to join in with them. So be sure to keep your schedule, although you probably want to pack it as tightly as possible. Be sure to keep it open in the beginning so that you have more options and don't limit yourself uh, before you even get there. Mm -hmm. um. Yeah, um, just to speak to that with the, the schedule for and having those two long um, breaks, I actually didn't plan my first break until maybe a week and a half before, mm -hmm. which felt like it was short notice, but it ended up being great. Um, and one of the things you don't realize when you're living in the U.S. is that when once you're in Europe, it's so easy to get around everywhere, especially with budget airlines like Ryanair um, and EasyJet, uh, that it's very um, low cost to get to a lot of places, um, even on short notice. So just something to think about. Great. And then, um, and then moving on to where you're going to be staying when you're abroad. One of the best parts I thought about my study abroad experience was my homestay. Mm -hmm. um, you'll be receiving your homestay assignment um, fairly soon. I think they're finalizing the homestays right now, but you should be receiving an email from Kate in the upcoming. Is, Kate, will you be sending it out or is that Karen? Um, it'll come from one of the two of us. Typically, I'll send it out and Karen will be copied on the message. Karen is our housing specialist over in X. Um, and she'll, she, she'll be taking all of your homestay um, requests into consideration when pairing you with the best host. Great. So the homestay is just a great opportunity for you to practice your French, get to see what the local culture is like, um, and have like one-on-one -on -one contact with, with a French native. Um, the families that we use have been with our program for a number of years. They're very familiar with American students. And, you know, they're going to treat you like adults that you are. So... They'll, um, they'll respect you and you'll have enough independence, but it's also nice to be able to come home and talk to them about your day. If you ran into something that was strange or had a kind of a culture shock day, you can talk to them about it and they can maybe explain, you know, why things were done a certain way. Also, you get to uh, enjoy the delicious Provencal cuisine. Uh, all your dinners, uh, early six dinners a week will be provided for you. And the dinner time is a great time to also get to know your host family better, practice your French, and um, really take full advantage of being abroad. Um, Carly, is there anything you want to chime in about your homestay? Um, I had a pretty special case. I, I'll talk to homestays generally. You're going to find a pretty wide variety of situations, so um, don't necessarily plan on it or have it sort of idealized in your head that it's going to be a family with like children your age or whatever. Like it, it may be very different from something you've done before when abroad. Um, there are some families that are single moms with one kid. There's um, elderly women, um, families with three kids in an extra room, that kind of thing. So um, 
you'll find that you and your friends are in a wide variety of of homestays and either homes or apartments. It'll really depend. Mm -hmm. And most of them are within 15 to 30 minutes of IAU, so and that's walking distance. So be sure to pack comfy shoes. That's one thing that um, every student that's returned has said is they walked a lot. Um, in Europe, in general, walking is just one of the most common sources of transportation. So it'll help balance out all the baguettes and delicious cheeses that you'll be eating. But um, just keep that in mind. You will be walking to and from your host family in the IU buildings, although there are um, buses um, as well that you can take if you choose to do so. Um, so these are just some of our host families. Um, oh, the picture in the bottom right-hand corner is a park that was actually right next to my host family. It was a great place to go for picnics and enjoy the evenings, read a book. Um, you just bring your cheese and wine and baguettes and have like a nice leisurely afternoon on the weekends. Yeah, um, it's on the way to Marshoots. Yeah, one thing, one thing that you'll want to keep in mind when um, talking with your host families is um, Europeans in general are very curious about the United States, the United States being, you know, so front and center with a lot of um, international relations events. Uh, the French, especially your host family, will want to know your opinions on things the U.S. is doing, whether you agree. Since we just had the elections, I'm sure that there'll be a lot of questions about whether we were for Obama or for um, McKay, or Obama or for Romney, what your interests are, um, where you fall on the political spectrum, the wars uh, in Afghanistan and in Iraq, and also just, you know, the U.S.'s relationship with France in general. So be sure to brush up on that kind of stuff. I actually learned more about the United States when I was in France than, uh, than I had when I was in, um, when I was back in the U.S., just because it was always on kind of the tip of everyone's tongue and there were so many questions that it forced you to kind of pay attention. Mm -hmm. um, courses in academics. So for, um, for most of you, you'll be enrolled into, in five courses. And you should be receiving a course schedule soon. And that'll be confirmed upon your arrival in X. Um, the courses will be Monday through Friday, although you know it's going to depend depending on what courses you're taking. But generally, you will have courses every day. Um, the grading and the method of instruction is a little bit different than the, United, than the United States. It's a hybrid of U.S. and French faculty members at IAU. So it kind of combines the U.S. and French method of grading. Some of your professors will grade you on the French system, which is out of 20 instead of out of 100. But regardless, your transcript will still show the A, B, C, D um, grading system. So when you receive your transcript, it will be the U.S. model. But um, different professors will have different methods of testing. Some will put more emphasis on exams. Others will have projects. It's very similar to probably your home institution in the United States. But um, just like your home institution, you will be expected to attend classes. Um, attendance is mandatory. Um, and then your textbooks you'll be receiving when you arrive there. So that's nice. You don't have to pack them before you go, and you don't have to bring them back with you. Um, is there anything you want to add, Carly, about how your academic? I know that you um, you were able to do some really cool things with some of your courses, right? Yeah, um, I took the painting and drawing class at Marshutes, which is I, I was in the IAU college, but not um, in the arts program. So I just took one painting and drawing class, which was absolutely fantastic. Um, I was in um, media and conflict, and then the French cinema class. Um, I found that my workload was uh, relatively low compared to classes in the U.S. Um, I go to Colgate, um, and um, I think that that was really nice to have because it allowed me to learn a lot outside of the classroom that wasn't necessarily part of my formal education abroad. Um, and I also went on the conference to trip to Strasbourg where I learned a ton and got to travel with uh, eight other IAU students and with Carl, the president of um, IAU College. And um, what else can I say about it? I had m mostly papers, a couple of projects, but um, <laughs> nothing expensive. I didn't do any of the classes that were uh, real things, but 
Um, I know people really loved those. So I think there's something to look forward to in every course, and there's a wide variety of things of options. So. Hmm. And then for those of you that are interested in the French Honors program, um, the French Honors is a program that we recently started for students that have a high proficiency in French. So you need to have completed four or the equivalent. Um, and this is a great way for those of you that are looking to really enhance your French proficiency and want a true immersion or French language immersion experience. Um, a lot of times it becomes self-selective just based on what courses you choose to enroll in in the spring, but you may have already received notifications from our dean, um, Dr. Lee Smith, um, asking if you would be interested in um, participating in this particular program. Um, one of the best things about it is it involves a one-unit seminar, and this is just a extra, well, it's a four-credit honors course, and you keep a daily journal, you meet with um, Dr. Smith, and really get to work on um, your language skills and all of your excursions will be in French. So for those of you that really want to have your language proficiency skyrocket, this is a great opportunity for that. Um, they partner you with a language partner from um, a local French university so that you have others uh, around your age that you can converse with and meet up with. There are special lectures for you, special receptions. Um, it's all conducted in French, which is why there is that. French um, require that French level requirement. Um, let's see. Anything else to add to this one, Kate? Uh, nope. Just that if you're interested in doing the French Honors Program and haven't told us already, just to reach out to us. And then the same thing goes for internships. Um, we have over 30 different internships available to students next semester um, because we do have so many. Um, but it is quite competitive, please be sure to notify Dr. Lee Smith uh, before you leave for France. If you are interested in an internship, once you arrive in X, there will be a short interview and um, the application process um, will actually take place before you even leave. So if you notify us, we can send you the application itself and then you'll conduct your interview upon arrival to X. But this is a great opportunity to see what it's like working abroad. Um, get that inter get the work experience that looks great on resumes to be able to tell um, you know future employers that you've had experience working abroad, especially in a foreign language setting, um, really sets you apart from from other students that or from others that may be applying for that position. Um, we've had internships in the past that have involved teaching, working at a, ba a bakery, at a law firm, um, marketing, public relations, communication. So we really have something for every major and I highly encourage you to look into it. Our students that are business and French honors have priority, but that doesn't mean that the internships are restricted solely to those um, students. This is some examples of internships. And then probably one of the best parts about um, studying abroad are all the trips that you get to do and all the sites that you'll visit. So. Um, as I'm sure you've already seen, there are two to three excursions per semester in summer that everyone will be able to participate in. And they're usually an overnight um, trip. Um, when I say to brother, is the overnight trip to Nice um, and the Côte d'Azur. So we visited, um, where did we go? We went to Antibes, uh, Nice. I did an individual trip to Cannes. And it was just a great way to... Um, see this different site and see the beautiful French Riviera. Um, Carly, you recently did it. How, how was your experience with the... It was great. The trips are really fun. Um, we did an overnight to Nice, and then the other two trips were um, day trips. We went to Le Luberon, where um, like most of the professors went with us, which was cool to have them sort of connect it back to the classroom. Mm -hmm. um, you have a lot of free time in the places that you're visiting to just explore. Um, when we went to Nice, we went to Monaco and saint paul de Vence. And then um, the third trip was to Fontaine de Vaucluse and Ile sur la Sorgue. Um, so these are places you can't really reach by bus um, regularly. And so it's a really good idea to take advantage of um, IAU offering these um, more formal um, bus tours because they pay for you to get to get to these really cool locations. Mm -hmm. Perfect. And then I'm just going to wrap up quickly here so we can open it up to Q&A before the end of our session. Um, 
don't forget what um, before you leave to connect with IAU, join our Facebook page or Twitter account. Um, info session will actually be uploaded to you. We can also access our videos on YouTube. Um, and something else that we're trying to encourage students is to become an IAU ambassador. Kelly's actually one of our ambassadors, and it's just a volunteer um, opportunity for alumni to interact with um, future students, kind of give them, as Carly's doing, insight as to what to bring, what to expect when you're traveling, and also, um, you know, talk to your study abroad office at your home institution, your faculty members, and serve as a representative of IAU. Um, back in the United States and bring other students that also enjoy this um, study abroad experience. Um, one thing that you might want to take a look at before you take off is to look into our blogs. We have a number of um, student bloggers who are keeping track of their time in X, detailing their different trips, their courses, their day-to-day -day life, and it's a really great way to kind of get gain some insight into what you can expect while you're in Aix-en-Provence. And then finally, don't forget to take a lot of pictures. Um, I know that most students end up taking hundreds and hundreds of them. And one of the ways that we reward the good pictures is we do have IU photo contests, both here and in Aix. And um, you know, taking those pictures could earn you uh, cash prizes and also recognition on our website. So um, be sure to keep. Uh, take detailed pictures, especially of your excursions, of any class, anything that's classroom related, your activities that you do, the IU activities and whatnot. And then I think I'm just going to open it up to questions now since we are running low on time. Um, let me come back to the webinar. All right. Okay. Welcome okay. back. Does anyone have any questions to start off with? For Kate, myself, or Carly? Anybody? Sarah, did you have some questions that you had typed out? About the phone? Did I lose everyone? Oh, I have a question. Um, you Can you hear me now? Card, mm hmm. The insurance card. Oh, okay, I was just asking Hello. about. Do we have? Hello. Um, Go ahead. Can I ask a question? Okay, I think she's asking about the insurance card. So you, yeah. you'll be covered by the by IAU's insurance, and you should have the letter of coverage that Kate sent to you. So I would just bring a copy of that. And then once you arrive in X, they'll give you more detailed information about how the insurance actually works. Um, mm -hmm. And do they give them a card on site there, Kate? Yes, I believe um, Kristen gets the cards and then puts them in the student mailboxes at the beginning. Yeah, of the you get one, like, the second day that you're there. Great. And Car Carly, did you just keep yours, like, in your wallet when you were over there? Yeah. Um, I kept it with my U.S. insurance card, I think. I don't really know why I carried those. <laughs> Brian, I, I didn't have any um, medical needs, so oh. I didn't really use it. <laughs> I needed it very fast. Sarah, did you have any questions about the cell phones, or did you get that answered already? Um... I was just asking in general, oh, should we have both or okay. is just um you said something about our courses being finalized and we get to act, but I wanted to have them by my department before I leave so that I know I can receive credit for my major. You said we're still gonna receive um a preliminary um uh, confirmation of our courses or no? Yeah, you'll re you'll receive that via email by our staff in France if you haven't already. Um, they've been enrolling students in all of the courses over the last couple of weeks, so if you hadn't heard from them yet, you should shortly. Yeah, Carly, when you arrived, you already had your courses selected for you, correct? Yeah, yeah. yeah I um, I basically I did my transfer credit form with the tentative 
schedule that I had that I had applied for certain classes and assumed that I would get them. And my school just said, give us these so that you at least are getting credit for four classes. And if you end up changing, you can change the form later. Um, that will probably change registrar to registrar. But um, you should just try and go ahead with the information that you have um, if you're really concerned about it. And I know when I arrived, I there was like a week period that I could change my schedule if there was something that I would rather take or there's a little bit of flexibility that first week. So again, you'll receive your schedule and then you can make a couple modifications if you have backup or alternate courses that are also approved by your study abroad office or by your local institutions, you can make that change as well. Um, I heard, well, I got with my pre-departure packet an ISIC card form. Is that, I asked some of my friends who are on the IAU program right now, and they said it wasn't really necessary, and that other people said that they could use their French visa to get into museums and stuff. I was just wondering, like, yeah. how many people buy ISIC cards? Is it, are there other discount cards that we can use, like... I know I bought an ISIC card when I went abroad, and I used it a handful of times. I think it's $25 to purchase, and mm -hmm. it really depends on what you're interested in doing. I think I was able to get some discount, student discounts at museums. Um, other students have told us that it's really not worth it. Um, Carly, did you get one? I didn't have one, and most of my friends didn't use theirs. Um, when you're in Paris, you're actually your, uh, you need your French visa. But most other places, you can just use your IAU student card, which they'll give you when you get there. Um, it basically, in most countries in Europe besides the UK, it's under 25 as a student in Europe. Some places are more stickler for um, actually being an EU citizen. Um, but I didn't find that discounts were particularly advantageous with the ISIC card. So. Um, it's really up to you. I would definitely peruse the website and see like exactly what kind of discounts you're like looking to get because if it's things at hostels, you're most likely not going to book at that one hostel in Rome that they yeah. had they were looking at that. versus like just going on Hostel World and finding the best deal you can get. Okay, thanks. <laughs> Well, if you have any follow-up questions or, um, you know, after review of all this information, want to ask anything else, feel free to contact us. Um, you should have our emails, our phone numbers, and like I said, I'll be posting this broadcast online so you can also see it um, later on and access it at your leisure. Um, are there any other questions now before, before we begin the next one? <laughs> Are you guys excited about your upcoming trip? Or you just have to get through finals first? Mm -hmm. Finals first. <laughs>